Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. As you're making your travel plans, remember johnnydollarair.com. johnnydollarair.com is a Priceline affiliate. So you get all of the benefits of going to Priceline.com, but part of your purchase price supports the great detectives of old time radio at no additional cost to you. So remember, when making your travel plans, check johnnydollarair.com first. Now it's time for today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air date, April the 16th of 1961, and this one is the Latrodectus Matter. Johnny Dollar. John, uh, this is Harry Branson at Philadelphia, Philadelphia Mutual, Mutual Liability, Liability, and Liability and Casualty Insurance Company. What? Well? Well, yes, yes, of course. Where else would I be? Well, I don't know. Maybe we better give that a little thought, huh? Yes, yes, perhaps it's... Oh, now, John, I wish you wouldn't do this. It confuses me so. (laughs) All right, Harry, don't let it throw you. But every time I call you up on some serious insurance matter, you start this this nonsensical, this... uh, Well, why waste time discussing it? To say nothing of the money for this long-distance call. Exactly. Okay? Goodbye. Goodbye? No. Well, which is it? Oh, please, John, please, this is very important. I'm sure it is, Harry. You must come down here and see me right away. Well, what's the trouble? Well, one of my clients, a man, a gentleman by the name of Eustace Royal Pennybank... Pennybank? Yes. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Isn't he that bug chaser, that butterfly collector who hit all the picture magazines a few years ago? Butterfly chaser, indeed. He's one of the greatest entomological researchers in the country today. I'm sure he is. Entomology, John, is a branch of zoology dealing with insects. Oh, uh, well, what happened? One of his bugs get loose and take a nip out of him? Well, far worse than that, John. From what he told me on the phone... The work of his whole career, perhaps even his very life, is being threatened. Threatened by whom? I don't know. But if you'll fly on down right away, I'll have him meet you here in my office and tell you himself. Now, according to this time... All right, Harry, all right. Just keep your shirt on. I'll be there. The CBS Radio Network brings you Bob Reddick in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Insurance Company in Philadelphia. Where else? Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Latrodectus matter. <laughs> Expense account item one, 2525, taxi to Bradley Field, a plane to Philadelphia, and then a cab into Harry's office on Walnut Street. There he introduced me to a tall, gaunt, gray-haired man in his 60s whose almost green eyes were as sharp and piercing as any I'd ever seen. In his own way, he made no bones about being quite an authority in his field. Understand this, Mr. Dollar. The results of my research always have been, always will be, of inestimable value to the scientific world. No question of it, John. Mr. Branson. Dr. Pennybank is without question one of the finest, the most famous for his work among the low... Mr. uh... Branson, please. Uh... Yes, sir. Yeah, Harry, let the doctor tell it his own way. Yes, Mr. Dollar, I insist upon it. And without further interruption, Mr. Branson. Well, I was only trying to make clear that I I was... uh... Yes. Yes. In my safe, at my home, are literally priceless records resulting from my researches in toxicology. Uh, That is to say, poisons, John. You see, the doctor... Branson? Uh... Sorry. Go on, Doctor. You see, I and I alone was able to determine that the South Jersey cattle killing some years ago were accomplished with the venom of a gistrogen mocasin. With what, sir? 
Of course, I must pardon your ignorance of such matters. Oh, please do. I proved that the killers of that unfortunate dairy herd used the deadly venom of the snake known as a copperhead. Copperhead. Believe me, sir, no one else would have been capable of differentiating it from the poison of, say, a gistrogen perseverus. Ah. The watermark of sin, as any child should know. Fascinating, Dr. Pennybank. Fascinating. Uh, fa that, Mr. Dollar, was before I decided to devote my unique talents solely to entomology, particularly to study and classification of the various arachnida. Arachnida. A rather profuse class of the order Araneida. Yeah, well, I'm afraid you're still over my head, Doctor. I don't doubt it. The Araneida comprise a small part of the insect world. Oh, I see. I doubt it. Well, I try. Suffice it to say, however, I have produced findings and maintained the necessary records that are of international importance in these troubled times. Of course. And someone has been after them. Although I've seen no visible sign, I'm certain that attempts have been made to enter my home, my laboratory, several times, and always at night. Well, if the findings on these insects or poisons or whatever are of international importance, why not turn them over to some government agency? Of course, I shall, after I have completed my research, checked and double-checked everything. Meanwhile, I must have all these records, these papers, immediately accessible. Well, what about having copies made that can be kept in, say, a bank vault? Well, that would incur the risk of having the information they contain leak out through whoever made the copies. May I suppose so. Meanwhile, by way of protection, I have isolated a select group of the genus Latrodectus. Latro what? Latrodectus, Latrodectus. Good heavens, man, don't you know anything? All right, all right, Latrodectus. However, if my watch is correct, I must go uh, now. Tell me this, Doctor. Aren't you taking a chance leaving your place to come here and talk to me? I left my place. It's in Kinwood, you know. Uh, Kinwood's one of our suburbs, John. Yes, I please, know. Please, please, I left not to come here and see you. You will come and see me this evening. Mr. Branson will give you the address. I left only because I must make a luncheon speech before a group at the Academy of Science, whether they like it or not. I am late for it now, Mr. Dollar. I will see you this evening. Oh, now, wait, please. I Doctor. agree. But I got the idea from Harry that you yourself might be in danger. That's right. They would stop at nothing to get at my records. That's why I must see you this evening, Mr. Dollar. Now, wait just a minute, please, this Dr. Penny. But... Harry... Are you sure this famous man of yours hasn't become just an old crackpot? John, how can you? Well, perhaps he was a great brain once, but now... Well, they wrote him up in all those picture magazines. Some years ago. Uh, but, of course, my concern is over the $50,000 policy we've written on his life. Oh? Who's the beneficiary? Several scientific organizations and a niece by the name of Clara, Clara Benson. Well, if somebody is trying to get at him, which I doubt, maybe I better check up on her. Meantime, give me his address. <laughs> Item two, a buck for a cab to the Bellevue Stratford where I parked my bag. Item three, 285 for lunch. Item four, 50 bucks deposit on a rental car. I did a little sightseeing by way of killing time, and then about 3 p.m., Figuring Dr. Pennybank had had plenty of time to finish his lecture on the birds and bees and get back to his home, I drove out to the address in Kinwood. The house was a small affair of weathered stone surrounded by poplar and maple trees, a garage at the rear. As I walked up the steps, I heard a door close in the back, so I knew he'd returned. Dr. Pennybank? Don't tell me that he's left again. That's funny. Unlocked. Well. Hello? Anybody home? Dr. Penny... Dr. Pennybank. Doctor? Repeat after me, please. What do you want when you need brand? What do you want when you need brand? 
Reliability. Reliability. Now, what do you get in Kellogg's All Brand? What do you get in Kellogg's All Brand? Reliability. Right. Hi, this is Dennis James to explain why Kellogg's Way is the reliable way to get the effectiveness you want from Brand with just half a cup a day. See, Kellogg's All Brand is the real Battle Creek formula, the one that millions of people depend on. And they depend on it because Kellogg's All Brand contains more vital brand bulk to help you keep regular. It's low in calories, and it's mighty pleasant eating, too. Kellogg's All Brand comes in crisp, toasted shreds that have a wholesome brand muffin taste. I think you'll like it. So be sure you remember, for the effectiveness you want from brand, get reliable Kellogg's All Brand. That's what you get in Kellogg's All Brand. Reliability. Dr. Pennybank was dead, all right. Two bullets through the chest had taken care of that. That car, the one that pulled away from the back, one of the brand new compact models in a dark green, at least I've seen that much. But as for license number, or whoever was in it, why hadn't I really taken a good look at it? What I did take a good look at, though, was Penny Banks' laboratory in a wing at the far end of the hall. The laboratory was alive. With more varieties of bugs and beetles, butterflies and moths, roaches, spiders and scorpions that I'd never seen before. They were in little clear plastic cages, row after row of them, all about the sides of the room, piled up sometimes 10, 12, 15 high, neatly in groups of each kind. And all the insects were alive. There were sacks and boxes, even a small refrigerator full of a thousand different kinds of food for them. And the sound as they scratched or walked or fluttered or simply rubbed their wings together. Well, it was a strange sound, and I felt strangely uncomfortable. Some of them, especially the moths and some of the spiders, were very beautiful. On one of the tiny cages, I saw the word the doctor had used. Latrodectus. And under it, the words, Black Widow. That cage was empty. Well, so much for spiders, I had a gunshot murder on my hands. I started toward the telephone in the hall to put in a call to the police when I heard heavy footsteps outside the front door, which I'd closed but not locked. The steps sounded cautious. I drew my gun, slipped to one side to be in back of the door if it was opened. And through the frosted glass, I could see the shadow of a man. And then... As he gently pushed open the door, I rushed him. Ah! Okay, brother. No, you don't. Get out of my head, will well, you? I just hold it there, officer. Who oh, are you? I'm sorry about the rough stuff, officer. I thought you were his killer coming back to make sure he'd done the job right. Killer? What are you talking about? Who are you? Here, you better see my credentials. Yeah. I'm Johnny Dollar, special investigator. Here. Okay. Oh, it looks okay, but don't you know better than to jump a cop? Well, I'll tell you oh, this. that crack about a killer? Look for yourself, over there. What? And here. You better have your gun. Hey, Dollar. That's Dr. Pennybank. That's right. Dead? Dead. Well, I guess that means only one thing. You think you know who might have done it? Yes, sir. In other words, now it's my turn. <coughs> That's right, Dollar, whatever your name is. Now, you and me are going to take a little ride into headquarters. I suppose I couldn't blame him. Officer Folland, I mean. But at headquarters, where my prints and identification were thoroughly looked into, he ended up apologizing to me. Meanwhile, a lab crew went out and took a look at Dr. Pennybank's body and then hauled it in for the autopsy required by law. The first report stated only that he'd been killed instantly at close range with a 25 caliber Colt automatic. No clues whatsoever to his killer. And he kept very much to himself, Dollar. Well, now, Sergeant... We uh, found that out when he asked us to have somebody check in on him now and then, if there was anything unusual around. You know, like Officer Fallon saw your car parked up front. I see. Only traces of anybody else that we could find. Yeah. Some things belonging to the cleaning woman who used to go in once a week, and uh, some clothing and stuff that belongs to his niece. Clara Benson. Yes, sir, that uh, pretty young widow. 
She used to drop in on him, cook him a good meal, spend the night now and then. Do you have her address? Yes, sir. We're trying to get in touch with her now. Tell her the bad news. Only I'd taken a really good look at the car that pulled away when I got there. Well, it's too bad you didn't, because your description could fit at least a couple of thousand cars here in the Philadelphia area. What I'd like to find is that little gun that was used. But, of course, unless we do, and it has some prints on it... One of his belt loops was torn as though a keychain had been ripped off. No sign of any keychain, Dollar. And the boys went over the place, even that crazy laboratory with a fine tooth comb. Tell me, Sergeant, have you checked on that cleaning woman you mentioned? Uh, she's been laid up in the hospital the past couple of weeks. Still is. Well, that lets her out. Yeah. No, oh, she freely admitted she was fed up with that cantankerous old crackpot and all these bugs, same as anybody else in his right mind would be. But, Dollar, she's in the clear. Me, those bugs. Millions of them. Latrodectus. What, sir? For protection, he'd said. Latro... What did you say? Latrodectus. And, Sergeant, it's suddenly given me a really wild hunch. Like what? Just give me an address and I'll see you later. <laughs> This is Arthur Godfrey. Many people ask me questions about cancer. Well, knowing the correct answers to some of these questions could actually help you save your life. I want you to get in touch with your unit of the American Cancer Society and get a free booklet of life-saving facts. And I want you to do something else to help conquer cancer. And research can do that. If all of us will help, we have to dig down deep. When an American Cancer Society volunteer, someone you know perhaps, calls on you, be sure you give generously. Thank you, Arthur. For that free booklet of life-saving facts, write or phone your unit of the American Cancer Society. And as Arthur Godfrey suggested, to help conquer the disease, give generously when an American Cancer Society volunteer, your neighbor calls on you. The lovely young widow, Clara Benson, there at her modest little apartment was just exactly that. Lovely. Tall, black-haired, with a complexion that other girls can only dream about. A very plain, black sheath dress couldn't hide her beautiful figure the kind you don't write home about. Although obviously upset, she controlled herself well. But her dark eyes were red from weeping. Yes, Mr. Dollar, the policeman came and told me all about it. Why, oh, why does a terrible thing like this have to happen to a nice, fine old man like Uncle Eustace? I wish I knew. And he wasn't senile or any of those other things people said. He was just trying to prove he was still a great scientist. Do you have no idea who might have done it, Clara? Oh, no, Johnny. May I call you Johnny? I wish you would. Thank you. No, I, I don't see how anyone could have murdered him. What if it was a little peculiar that his whole life was wrapped up in all those... those, those bugs and things that, that he spent all his time and money on them? Was he doing any harm to anyone? Well, from what he told me, Clara, your uncle seemed to think he was on the track of something very important, something worth a great deal of money. What was it, Johnny? You don't know? Oh, I understood that some of the men who came to see him now and then wanted to give him money for the reports he kept hidden away. What men? Do you know who they were? Just people who came to see him. Reports hidden away, hidden where? I don't know, Johnny. I don't care. Did any of the people that you mentioned ever approach you about these important papers? Me? Why should they? That is your car I saw out front of them. Yes, that poor, dear old beat up. Oh, no, Johnny. What? The policeman told me about the car you saw. Surely you didn't think it could have been mine, that, that I could pass. Oh, no. Do I look like the kind who could... Oh, no, that's a horrible thought. How dare you think that? Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, Johnny, but I'm so upset. And I feel so alone. First it was Ralph, my husband, and and now my uncle, and I, I... I'm sorry. 
Now, how did your husband die, Clara? Some, some awful hit-and-run driver they never did find out. And, Johnny, I, I'm so alone now. If I knew where he'd hidden those papers, I wonder if they'd be any key to this whole thing. Well, I don't know, but how could they? Where could they be? Well, maybe if I can get out this way and tomorrow, maybe I'll kind of look around his house again. Tomorrow? I left my bag in at the Bellevue Stratford in town. Oh. Um, I will see you again, won't I, Johnny? Sure. And now things were adding up. Item, cui bono? Who benefits? Apparently none but this beautiful, black-haired young widow. Item, who did kill her husband? But we better let that one pass. Yet the gun that killed the doctor was twenty-five caliber. A woman's gun? Could be. Item, those valuable papers. The doctor had mentioned a safe, possibly a wall safe. So what about the keys that were taken from his body? Item, latrodectus. Black Widow. Penny Bank had said for protection. And then another hunch. Somehow I didn't feel that that shoddy, beat-up old car went with Clara's personality. It was getting late, but I started hunting up nearby used car lots. And luck was with me. At my third stop, I found the dealer who'd sold her that old wreck. And when? That very afternoon. Oh, mister, why she trade in this nice new green compact here for that old thing is beyond me. But why she complain of what I do? Now that cinched it for me. I drove on back to Clara's apartment, and as I fully expected, she wasn't there. I tore on out to her uncle's home. It was after dark now, but I parked well over a block away and approached the place quietly. Under one of the drawn shades, I could see there was a light on somewhere inside. The front door, as I thought it might be, was locked. But I managed to jimmy a window on the laboratory wing. Inside, nothing but the sounds of the insects. Carefully feeling my way, trying to remember the layout of the house from prowling around in the afternoon, I looked for the source of the light. It was coming from the kitchen. And as I approached it through the hallway, at the far side I could see a door, an open door, leading down to a lighted basement. And below, I could hear the ring of keys against metal, the turning of a lock, the wall safe. I could hear it clank open. And then, gun in hand, as I was about to sneak on down the stairs... Clara! By the time I could reach her side and beat them away, she had fallen unconscious. She'd been struck by tens, by scores of them on her hands, on her arms, struck down by the beautiful, deadly protectors of that safe. Latrodectus. Black Widows. Clara died within minutes before I could possibly get help. And the papers she'd killed her uncle to obtain... Nothing. Nothing but the confused scribblings of a demented old man. Expense account total, including the trip back to Hartford, $111.35. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, one of the toughest gangs I ever had to deal with. A gang of kids, a rat pack. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours 
truly Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Reddick, is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Heard in our cast were Lawson Zerby as Dr. Penny Bank, Elaine Rost as Clara Benson, Robert Dryden as Harry Branson, Ralph Bell as the police sergeant, and Jack Grimes as Officer Folland. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Art Hannah speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. Hi, this is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site where we put out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old-Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. Well, that notice for the Rat Pack matter spoiled my hope of having seen the title that we would actually be dealing with something regarding the historic uh, Rat Pack uh, that was so big in the 1960s. I love the title of this episode. I also love the atmosphere, and the conclusion was good, uh, too, with a bit of an ironic twist. I helped a bit by the music, which set the stage for the suspense. Of course, this is one of those cases where we're only really given one suspect. I mean, we could pretty much all sit down and reason out Quay Bono, and yeah, we know who benefits. Other than that, a pretty interesting episode. All right, well, listener comments and feedback now. And I received uh, so many comments after uh, the wrong sign matter. This is one where we received a lot of similar emails, so I'm not going to read them all, but I do thank everyone who contacted me on this. I was not sure how uh, the secretary in that episode got the... uh, fake will into the safe given that only the niece and the uh, victim had access to the safe. And uh, we'll go ahead and we'll start with a response here received from Marky, who says, writing about uh, episode 2407, yours truly, John or the Johnny Dollar, the wrong sign matter. You say you weren't sure how the bad guy got the will in the safety deposit box. At one point, Dora said she found the will tucked in some stocks, and Johnny says, oh, that's how it got in there. I believe the guy was hired to help with the office paperwork, and the implication was he forged the will and stuck it in some papers that either Dora or the old lady were going to put in the safe deposit box. The other reason I'm writing is because something big happened today. I caught up. I started listening to the podcast in the 800s around 2013 and caught up with you around episode 1000. Then I decided to get the app and started episode 1. Wow, 2,407 episodes and any number of specials later, and I've caught up. Uh, That's a lot of detectives. I've had the app on three different phones and shared it with several friends and family. Uh, But you brought us through it all, keeping us informed and excited. Uh, Well, thanks so much, Mark, and I appreciate the comments. And I've received uh, comments... Uh, from Marky over the years uh, with an reference, just a little uh, note he sends me regarding an episode, and usually I don't read them because they're regarding episodes we played uh, long ago, and some people may not even have been listening back then, but I always appreciate hearing them and that people are uh, engaging with them, even if I don't happen to read them on the podcast, and I uh, appreciate all the comments we've received from Marky, and we'll look forward to hearing from uh, Marky as we are uh, all caught up. So thanks so much, and congratulations. Clarissa sent in a note, and after the uh, point that Marky raised, uh, she says... Uh, Uh, also, what does the wrong sign title refer to? Maybe they're hinting at signature. Uh, keep up the great work, love the podcast. And yeah, I think that is exactly what that's referring to, Clarissa. David uh, comments, uh, same thing, but he adds, uh, after the explanation, a sense from Johnny explaining that would have been welcome, though. And I'd agree. Well, I list, uh, reading what everybody's r- written, I can see how the implication was clear. And maybe I should have caught that, but that's not typically the way this 
works with uh, detective fiction. You know, you have uh, an explanation of what happened, a summation, even some things that should seem obvious get explained by the detective. And in this case, the fact that only the... Uh, only the victim and the niece could access the safe was a big deal throughout the episode. And so not to explicitly explain it, that's a bit of a writing issue. So I appreciate the folks who've caught it, but I would agree that we should have at least had a bit more clarification from Johnny. Joe had something else he was waiting for. I was waiting for the twist and it didn't happen. I really thought Dora did kill her aunt and that it wasn't actually natural causes and she was framing Pringle to cover her tracks after she killed her aunt. She would have still gotten the money. Not my favorite Johnny Dollar, but still enjoyable. All right, well, thank you for all your comments. I appreciate it when I get, you know, a lot of comments on an episode. It just shows how people are paying attention and engaging with the show. And so thanks to everyone who uh, sent it in. I've read your feedback, e even if I didn't read it on the program. I really appreciate you taking the time to send it in. All right, that'll do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Dragnet. Then next Friday, it's another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Check out our YouTube archive, youtube.greatdetectives.net. And follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.